Okay, so we have seen now how hierarchies work in Lightwave and parenting and child relationships. We have seen how space works and the hierarchical nature of space and therefore how coordinate transforms are applied and stored on items in our scene and items in a hierarchy. So, the next thing we're going to take a look at is going to be rotations and the orientations of things in our scenes. This is especially important to rigging because, of course, in the majority of situations, whether it's a character or a machine or any other number of things, an awful lot of the moving parts will be hinged. They will rotate at a certain point. And as such, understanding and properly managing rotations will be one of the most fundamental things to get right when designing and building our rigs. First of all, let me just direct you back to the Gorilla CG project again and recommend to you two of the videos, which are Euler Rotations Explained and The Rotation Problem. These again are non-application specific videos that cover some of the basic theory behind rotations in computer graphics. I recommend you watch these guys because they are brilliantly illustrated and very easy to follow and will probably be more helpful to you than me explaining these basic principles in a possibly not so well illustrated manner. So then, assuming that we've got those basics all down and you understand the ideas of Euler rotation and the different methods by which rotations can be represented in 3D, let's have a look at how things are done here in Lightwave. As we can see, we have our three rotation handles available to us, which are labelled as heading, pitch and bank, colour-coded in red, green and blue, the heading being here, the pitch being here, and the bank, of course, being here. Now, rotations in Lightwave, if we're going to talk about them in terms of X, Y, Z and rotation order, then of course the heading is twisting us about the Y axis, the pitch is turning us around the X axis, and the bank is turning us around the Z axis. So Lightwave's rotation order would be described as Y, X, Z. This suggests one thing to us immediately, the fact that there is a rotation order means that Lightwave's rotations are handled using Euler rotations. They are ordered. As such, they are prone to gimbal lock. In the case of Lightwave, as with other packages, they lock on the second eddy axis, which in Lightwave is the pitch here. So when that is at 90 degrees, we can see that we are in gimbal lock, giving us no side axis, for instance, for turning this away. This rotation order is also fixed in Lightwave. You cannot change it. Well, that said, actually you can. If you look in the motion modifiers, and this is for Lightwave versions 10.1 or higher, you will find this little fella, the rotation order converter, which allows you to set the rotation order. Sadly, however, this doesn't help an awful lot. For instance, if I set myself to ZYX here, then we can see that what is happening is I'm still gimbal locking in exactly the same fashion. All that is happening is that Lightwave automatically pushes other rotation axes to make up for it. And you can see the heading flip here. As such, this rotation order converter isn't something that you really want to use. Its primary use is there for when you have brought things in from another package, such as, say, Maya or Max, that have used a different rotation order. It's more of a fix than an actual tool that you would use directly itself. Therefore, the best thing to get used to and to just take it as granted is that the Lightwave rotation order is fixed as heading, pitch, bank, or Y, X, Z. Similarly, we have, of course, the same rotation problem. So if I just make a little animation here, I'll come out to, say, frame 10, bring this guy to 90 degrees on pitch there, and then what I shall do is come out to, let's say, frame 20, and I'm going to switch to the local axis mode here, which, of course, gives me axis handles on this otherwise blocked axis, and I'm just going to do a little 90 degree rotation there as well. And what do we see, of course? Well, we see the rotation problem. This thing does not make a nice straight square rotation from one point to the next. It wobbles about. And this, of course, if we look at the parent axis handles there, is on account of the fact that these axes are having to cross rotate over each other. So, 
What do we know then? Well, we know that the rotations are handled in a fixed way in Lightwave and that we have to work with them. And that's fine because it's totally possible to do. There are not really situations whereby we're going to be blocked from doing anything because we do not have quaternions or some other way of handling rotations, changing rotation order, etc. So long as we follow the rules, we will be able to get everything working out just nicely. Now, with all of that said, there is a certain adjustment that can be made when dealing with the rotations of items in Lightwave, and that is the base rotation of the pivot point. As we can see here, by standard, when something is just at 0, 0, 0, and of course initially created in world space, the axes of rotation are aligned to the world, and always this way round, with heading and pitch pointing off down the Z there, and the bank pointing up along the Y. Now whilst we cannot change the rotation order, you can change this initial set rotation. So let us say for instance that I was wanting to have this item here at 90 degrees there pointing down or whatnot, and I wanted this to be the 0, 0, 0 equivalent. Of course I'm in gimbal lock at this point, but what I can use is the record pivot rotation tool, which can also be accessed using shift P. When using that, our pivot rotation is re-recorded to point in the new direction. We can see I have gone back to 0, 0, 0 here. And now the alignment of my object is with the heading and pitch pointing down on the Y and the bank pointing forwards there on the Z. The same rules of rotation still apply, so it's still an Euler system and the rotation order is unchanged, but the base rotation relative to, obviously enough, its parent, which in this case is the world, has been altered. You can also change this via the set pivot rotation tool, which if I bring it up, you'll notice has my heading, pitch and bank set in this manner, which has happened when I recorded pivot rotation. If I set these values back to 0, 0, 0, then we get the original pivot rotation restored. These two methods are basically identical. You can either rotate in some fashion and record the pivot rotation, or you can use the set pivot rotation and add in whichever values you want it to have. Do notice that the enable IK switch here has turned off. Um, that happens when using the record pivot rotation tool. Not important at this stage, but it is something that you will want to remember for later on. The other thing with recording pivots like this is how recorded pivots interact with certain tools, particularly certain types of constraints. And whilst we won't cover those immediately here, these issues will come up later on in the training when we are looking at specific tools and how items are constrained to one another. Because what you have effectively done here if I just switch to the move tool and hit local axis mode, is you can see by rotating the pivot, I have rotated the local space. So just as we saw in the last video on spaces, when I am setting things up in my rig and I have to be spatially aware, it is not just the position in the hierarchy of a given space, it is also the orientation of that space, which will be important to making sure that everything lines up right and our rigs function properly. There is also one other little point of the way that Euler axis work, again, not just in Lightwave, but all packages that I really do have to make note of for you. I don't believe it is covered in the videos on Gorilla CG, and that is something known as the domain. Rotations can, of course, be represented as a vector and often under the hood in computer graphics, they are. These vectors are then converted to Euler values via a certain calculation. Now, vectors represent a direction more than they do degrees. So, for instance, here, this light is pointing forwards, and its bank or its twist is pointing up. We can just name the vectors forwards and up. But of course, if I rotate my heading, say, on 360 degrees, the light is still pointing forwards and up. If I rotate the pitch on, say, 720 degrees, the light is still pointing forwards and up. What this means is that when a vector is converted into an Euler set of axes, there is an infinite number 
of possible ways that you can do the calculation. You can come up with an infinite number of possible Euler values to represent any given vector. That is obviously useless. Therefore, Euler values are always constrained to within a domain, a set or a range of values. Not when operating on them directly, as I have done here with 360 and 720, but when cross-calculating them from vectors, which happens an awful lot when using certain types of constraint. And of course, all of that we will see in due course, and of course we'll see the importance of it. But just to give you the heads up ready for that, know that the domain allowed is anywhere between 180 and negative 180, for the heading axis, 90 and negative 90 for the pitch axis, and then once again 180 and negative 180 for the bank axis. We won't explore at this point all of the areas where this is important and the different kinds of constraints and the effects it has, but we will see these things as we go along and look at the outcomes of specific tools. So, with all of that down, let us take a practical example of these facts. Notice here that we have a, a character who's been set up and rigged, one of those who's available in the shares section of my website if you want to have a look for yourself. Obviously, he has a bunch of joints which rotate to pose him, and these are set up in keeping with the principles of rotation that we've seen. We can take, for example, the hip here, which is on the level this away. This allows us to turn the character around, so as when he's walking or doing stuff, he can face any way around in our scene, and the other axes are still as they should be. We don't get into any kind of lock in that way. Same, for instance, with the head, which we can swivel side to side, but because we're doing it on the heading axis this way, we always have the pitch to provide his up and down, no matter which way he is looking. A much more clear and important example is the shoulder here, where we have the heading to be the up-down movement of the shoulder. Now, this is particularly important because, of course, people are not in the habit of walking around with their arms stretched out like this. Most of the time, your characters will have their arms down at their sides. And by having the heading be this particular movement, what that, of course, allows us is the pitch is still free to do the front to back movement at this point. Had we set this up the other way round and had the pitch being the up and down, which many people will do and you will see done here and there, of course what would happen is when we had the arm down at the side we would be in gimbal lock and we would have no method to move the arm forwards other than of course switching to the local or world axis mode which would give us the result that when this movement was animated we would get the drift. So whilst the facts about these rotations are important for making sure that a rig functions properly and mechanically you don't get errors or strange things happening it's also important to pay attention to when actually planning the layout of controllers within a rig as you have to try and think about which way round you want a joint to work which way round an animator is going to want it to operate and we could do a joint by joint analysis of the entire character in this fashion which we won't do now but such things will come up when we are building characters later on